we'll, I'll do a, just a little bit of um, housekeeping that in case you didn't see the Slack, um, Priyanka was going to present today, but she has two sick kids. So um, she's not available slash not ready. I don't know exactly where, where she lies in that, but whatever it is, two sick kids is an excuse that is acceptable. Um, so we're going to kind of wing it. So Jonathan wrote learning objectives and was like planning to present. And then Priyanka was going to take it over. So he didn't ever get to the point of presenting. So at least we've got some level of ready to go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to be clear, I never got to the point of putting any slides. <laughs> so, right. you know, the furthest I got was like thinking about how I would present on this and then not having to. And so, uh, yeah, so I will, the only slide I will have to show is learning objectives. So I'm going to just hold off on sharing for a minute because we'll be looking at that plenty, I think. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is us kind of winging it here, but I think that there's enough we can hopefully talk about with this chapter because, like I said, I rather enjoyed it. And the more so far in this book, I've found that having a simple mind, I like things simplified for me. And I like people to tell me the things I don't have to worry about. And that's so far what this book has done a lot for data scientists. If you if you've read the chapter, you probably saw the phrase several times, this is not that important for data scientists or something along those lines. And it's not just saying that like, you don't need to know this because you won't use it so much, but it's also kind of saying, if you understand this thing, then you kind of got everything else covered. So that's, I want to try to pull that out of the chapter, chapter three today. <laughs> So if you read it or haven't read it, then maybe you, know, you can approach the chapter kind of with that sort of simple mindset. So I think the, the best place to start is to remember chapter two, which was a couple weeks ago now, really briefly. So remember in chapter two, the idea was we have this population, which is a hypothetical construct that in general, we cannot directly access, except through a sampling process where we kind of pick uh, individuals out of this population and a sample consists of say n individuals whether these individuals are actual people or, or measurements on something else it flips to the point we pick n individuals out and that is our sample and that's the only access we have to the population which is kind of like this abstract thing up there right we can only sample from and what we'd like to know to say about a population is some value, we call it a statistic or a metric or something, but we can't calculate it for a population because we don't have access to it, so we calculate it for the sample. And then we have the sample statistic. And then the important question is, now if I did that again, how different would the results be? Because again, I don't have access to the population, which is the thing I care mm -hmm. about, just a sample. So if I did that whole sampling process again, how different would the results be? Now, it's usually not feasible to do that whole process over again, because if I had the resources to do that, I just would have taken a bigger sample. Uh, so we have to rely on some heuristic, uh, maybe a little bit ad hoc methods to answer the question, if I did this again, what would the results be? So ideally, I would actually repeat that experiment a million times, but I generally can't. So I either rely on a theoretical analysis to tell me for certain metrics like the mean, what would happen if I did this experiment over again? And, I, and that's, that, that leads to certain special rules for certain cases like, uh, you know, if you did this again and calculated the mean, then this is what you would get. And that's the standard error of the mean. But for, an, for a general arbitrary statistic, which isn't the mean, probably the best thing we can do is a resampling process like the bootstrap, which is simulating doing our experiment a million times. Okay, so that's kind of the, remember that's like chapter uh, two. And the important takeaway from chapter two, I think, is that you can kind of often forget all these special rules if you understand bootstrap as a resampling process. You're simulating doing what you really wanna do, which is do your experiment a million times. Now in chapter three, 
we're moving on to statistical tests and statistical experiments. And the way I want to think of a statistical experiment is now instead of sampling a single population, I'm sampling two or more populations. And what I want to know is, are they actually the same population? So I sample two populations or more, and I do some calculation on those. Let's say, um, here's uh, to, to have a concrete example in your head, let's say that I'm doing drug testing, right? So I have a drug that's supposed to treat or prevent some disease, and I want to know if it's effective. So I have a, a whole set of individuals, and I give half of them the treatment, and the other half I give some placebo, right, or the control, whatever it is. And then I measure some result, like the disease incident in the two different populations. So now I, what I kind of, well, I should say the two different samples because I don't have access to the actual populations. So the, the hypothetical populations in this case are all people, you know, at risk for the disease or whatever, who have the treatment, and then all people who don't have the treatment. And are these two populations actually different? In other words, does the treatment make a difference in the population for the purposes of you know, the risk of disease. So that's kind of in a nutshell what a statistical experiment is. I want to do something on two different populations, and I want to know whether they're the same population under, underneath. In other words, let's say, I mean, let's say I, I do this experiment, and I get some, you know, a 15% rate of disease incident in one group, and a 17% rate of the disease incidents in another group. And I want to know, like, is the difference meaningful? Another way of putting that is, if I did this experiment again a million times, right, or just, if I did the experiment again, how different would the results be? So it's kind of like uh, what we did from chapter two. And I think at this point, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and show the LOs, because that's, I think, setting up the context enough for understanding the learning objectives that at least I identified here. Let me find this first. Okay. Okay. So here's the learning objectives that I identified for this chapter. And in addition to the what seven ish learning objectives that I listed. I also wanted to put like an overarching main point because I, I thought that that was mentioned enough in the chapter that it, I didn't want to get lost as just like one in the list. So kind of like in chapter two, I said, uh, if you can do a resampling process, which is like the bootstrap, you know, simulate sampling over and over again, that's the best thing you can do to understand your the results of your sample. In the same way for statistical experiments, where I'm sampling two different populations and doing some measurement on those, the best thing you can do to understand your result is a resampling. So resampling in this case is gonna look a little differently from resampling in the other case, uh, but it's the, same, it's the same kind of idea. So the, the chapter covered uh, A-B tests, which is kind of what I just described. The A and the B are your two different possible populations and you want to see whether they're actually the same population. And this is usually done in the, by using hypothesis tests, where, okay, I'm, I apologize if I'm not using the, all the right language here. I'm not an actual statistician. But my understanding is the null hypothesis is, no, the two populations are actually the same. And the alternative hypothesis is, no, the two, the two population, the two samples are actually there's, there's actually two different populations you sample from. And there are a whole lot of statistical tests that you can apply depending on exactly how your experiment is set up. And so sort of skipping down a little bit here, that's you know, the various traditional tests of significance. You know, if depending on whether I'm measuring categorical data or numerical data or how it's structured, they say, oh, you need you know, the t-test or the chi-squared test, or I mean, I think there's probably 
dozens of other statistical tests that can be really overwhelming to somebody with a simple mind like me coming in and you're like, what? <laughs> and you know, most of these tests, the, the result is often quoted as a p-value, which I'm sure we've all heard of in some context. Uh, so that's learning objective. Above this, we want to understand and know the proper uses and abuses of the concept of a p-value. <clears throat> and then, you know, I think is the, the key part of the chapter, again, moving up on this list here, Resampling procedures, really the dirty secret here is they kind of make all the traditional hypothesis tests obsolete. Because what it turns out is those hypothesis tests are just a way of getting around the resource limitations back in the day when you didn't have enough computers to do resampling. And so they were kind of simulating the results as if you could do resampling. But if you can do resampling, then you can forget about all the other tests. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't say it so strongly, but that's, that's kind of my takeaway from the chapter. <clears throat> and there is, at the end of the chapter, they talk about the multi-armed bandit, which is saying, hey, this is a useful thing to do in cases where you're doing a test and you actually care about deploying a good thing while you're doing the test. So you know, we, can, we can kind of get to that and say a really practical suggestion. Okay, uh, I'm gonna try to elaborate a little bit on at least some of these learning objectives. Again, I don't have any other slides prepared, so I'm really doing this off the cuff here. But at, in, a, at, in a little bit, I'm gonna like stop <laughs> and you know, we'll hopefully have a more interactive discussion. So, because I want to uh, get focused on what I think is the key thing to get out of this whole chapter, and you know, we'll, we'll take it from there. <clears throat> okay, so think again in the context of this uh, like drug experiment. You know, I have this experimental treatment I've developed. I want to know whether it's uh, you know effective. <laughs> so I have my two samples of the you know sample of the people that I've given the drug to and sample of people that I haven't. I calculate some metric on each of these samples, uh, like you know, what fraction of them say got the disease. And you know, I wanna know whether the difference between these two populations is significant or not. And loosely speaking, significant means if I could do this experiment over and over again, would I get uh, the same kind of result? Right. Okay, okay, keep that's a useful framework to keep in mind. Statistics I'm learning is all about if I did this again, what would happen? If it's not something that I can even conceptually do again, then statistics doesn't apply. Right. And if you disagree with that, go ahead and like challenge me on it. But I'm I'm coming to like if. If you have a process that you cannot even conceptually think of as a, a sample you can you know, repeat, you can do again, then you know, you're not doing statistics. This is something else, <laughs> but it's not statistics. <clears throat> okay, so usually my experiment is limited by resources. I can't just go out and get like a thousand volunteers every weekend and do a, a 10 year <laughs> you know, longitudinal test on whether you get disease and like, you know, we're, we're strongly resource limited here. So rather than do all these traditional tests of significance, which honestly, as reading this chapter, my takeaway was I don't need to know this. So it kind of went in and came out. And like, I can't, I'm not here prepared to explain the details of T tests and chi squared tests, you know, but I think those will make more sense in the context we're talking about. What we'd like to be able to do is repeat our experiment many times. And so just like we did with the bootstrap, we're going to do a kind of resampling on our single experiment. And the book talks about, let's see, I have a book here, a couple different kinds of resampling. They talk about exhaustive permutation tests and a bootstrap permutation tests. And then they get, they, they give a link to 
I didn't, I didn't go to the further reading, but they give a listing of some other book called Randomization Tests, and they say, don't get too drawn into the thicket of non-random sampling. So I think there's a whole like ocean beneath this, which we could get into and I haven't got into. So in my happy ignorance, I'm just going to describe this in the book. The, uh, the exhaustive permutation test, I think we can kind of ignore for now. That only is feasible when you have very small data sets anyway. It's exhaustive means I'm going to like by force take every possible um, sort of permutation of this data. And that's, you know, very quickly becomes infeasible. So let's think about the bootstrap permutation test. So remember the, hyp the hypothesis that I'm testing, the null hypothesis, is that, well, these two populations are in fact the same population. So the approach we're gonna take is, okay, let's assume that's correct. Let's assume the null hypothesis is correct for now. And see how likely we are to get the results that we got. So if I assume that these two populations are the same, that means, okay, let's say for my drug test, I'm assuming that the drug makes no difference at all. So I really just have a single population. In that case, I can, I can simulate the results of my experiment by doing a bootstrap. Let's, let's just say that I had a thousand people and divide them to um, you know, 500 with a treatment and 500 without. And you know, within those 500, some got the disease, some didn't. In the other 500, some got the disease, some didn't. I don't care, I'm just gonna smush all these thousand people back together in a big pool. Again, some got the disease, some didn't. And for my resampling now, I'm going to just draw 500 out at random and put them in category A. You got the treatment, but it didn't make a difference. And the other 500, or, or actually not the other, but yeah, the other 500, because it's, it's a permutation of the same data, take the other 500 and put them in group B and say, you didn't get the treatment, but it didn't make a difference. And then on those two groups, I measure the metrics. What percent of that group got the disease? What percent of the other group got the disease? And I do this resampling you know, a million times. And so what I get is I get uh, a distribution for whatever it is I care about. Let's say a distribution in the difference in disease incidence rates between the two groups. Now that distribution will probably be centered around zero in this case, because um, I didn't make any distinction in my resampling process. Like there is just a whole one big pool of people. I took out 500 and 500 character the disease rate. Sometimes by chance, group A will have more disease. Sometimes by chance, group B will have more disease. And so I'm gonna get some sort of distribution that's you know, centered around zero, but it's got some tails out there. Now I can go back to my original experiment and look at say the difference in disease incident between the treated group and the non-treated group and see how it compares with this distribution. This distribution that I get from my null hypothesis resampling procedure. And if the result from that experiment, the one experiment I did, lies kind of within that distribution from the null hypothesis, then I didn't learn anything. Well, I mean, my experiment is consistent with a hypothesis that is just one population and my treatment didn't make a difference. If my experiment result is way out on the tail or far off, you know, where uh, I, in a place where I didn't often get this result from my random you know, resampling procedure, then I think, okay, my treatment actually did something because if there were just one population, not two, then I probably wouldn't have gotten this result. And I can quantify that with the p-value saying, uh, if there were just one population, what's the probability that I would have gotten the result that I did? And if that's a low probability, then I'm more confident that my treatment actually does something. And that's this p-value, the probability that if there's just one population and not two, that I would have seen something like I saw. And every, now at this point, you can forget every other statistical test because every other statistical test is just trying to approximate the procedure I just described for you. And the nice thing about this is you can 
it's conceptually quite simple to apply this resampling or this, this you know, permutation process to any kind of experiment. You know, I don't need to like remember too much of the differences. Oh, do I use the chi squared test now or do I use the, the, the T test or whatever the other tests they mentioned here? I just simulate my experiment a million times and see whether my actual experiment falls within the range of simulated experiment results. Okay, and that's all statistics right there. <laughs> uh, okay, what did y'all think? Those of you who read the chapter, you know, what did you get out of it? Um, for me, uh, I think the book really did a good job explaining what we should care about as, you know, yeah. data science people. Uh, for example, like uh, mm -hmm. the degrees of freedom, if you have a large enough samples, you don't really need to worry about them. So that's, that was my biggest. Yeah, that was a lot in the book, right? Like, as a data scientist, this isn't, you don't need to know about this. Yeah. And by the third time I got to that, I was like, I'm, I'm sensing a theme here. <laughs> Anyone else have thoughts? I think you did a really great job describing <laughs> that resampling process. I wish I wouldn't have bought the book now. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, I took, um, I just finished grad school and like I finished um, like three statistics courses and all of them were focused on calculating these like um, sampling statistics based on like theoretical distributions. And like, yeah. if you don't meet all those assumptions then you know, your analysis kind of falls by the wayside. So this resampling idea, I, I'm not sure why they haven't taught it like that because you know we're still using R for for statistics courses, but um, yeah, it just makes a whole lot more sense, especially when you like plot the distributions and you can visualize the distribution of your sampling statistic. Um, yeah, like it, I think there's a whole lot of inertia in the field. Uh, I think it's the only explanation, and it's it's really kind of tradition bound. <laughs> And no offense at all to statisticians who are brilliant people, <laughs> but like there's, I think that's it. <laughs> can, you, uh, can you kind of take me through again the, the resampling? Like how would, it, how would resampling work in the case that you're talking about? If you have, if there, we have the whole entire population, but you have sampled a thousand, um, thousand subjects. Okay. But then... If you're resampling, are you are you choosing a, a different thousand, thousand different people, or are you recombining the thousand that you have? Yep. Because it, it, I, I didn't yeah. like that. So if, if you could. Yeah. So I'm 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 gathering that there's a lot of different resampling kind of procedures you could use, but from what I gather from the book, right? Resampling in general means using like reusing your original sample, think about it as the re-sample. So you, whatever you sampled the first time, that's all you have. And for the test that I described, it's a permutation. So I'm taking the thousand that I, you know, the, the same thousand people, you know, Jim, Jane, Joe, like, you know, like they're the actual people. And I'm just reassigning them to kind of group A and group B. So in my actual experiment, group A had the treatment, group B didn't but we're seeing what, what happens if it doesn't matter. So if it doesn't matter who had the treatment, then you know, Joe was in group A, first of all, but I mean, next time he might be in my resampled group B, right? So I, that's what, so I, yeah, it's just mixing them up again. The permutation is I take that thousand and 500 at random, now just I'm calling group A, and the other 500 I'm calling group B. But at least for the test they're describing here in the book, the permutation, it's the same thousand just reassigned. That's the, the permutation there. There's probably other resampling techniques. I, I gather that like this, this is actually, this, this is where you know, modern statisticians are probably doing a lot of their work. <laughs> and so, good. <laughs> so so in, in that case, if you have one person in there, Jim, you, you can't re-administer the experiment just to that individual, right? And so then is the idea then that you, you have a thousand people, you've administered the experiment, some of them got the placebo, some of them got the treatment. And, and, um, and so if you break those, those two into, 
if you break those thousand into two groups of 500, you might see an incidence of disease at 10% in one and 7% in the other. Okay. And, and for that, you know it's random because I've forgotten about, I mean, like the difference between seven and 10 is just due to the random resampling because for the resampling, I've forgotten all about who I gave the treatment to and who didn't. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. That was the actual experiment. We're, we're forgetting that for the moment. So then when you're resampling, you now mix everybody up again and you split them and you split them back out into two groups of 500. They're going to be, it's going to be different people in each group this time, but you might still expect to see one group with 10% incidence and the other group with 7% incidence. That's because of random. Yeah, maybe random. Yeah. Yeah. And, maybe, and maybe it's 11 and eight and maybe it's seven and, or 10 and six or whatever. Exactly. Then you mix it up again. And now you, and you do the same thing and you split them. And now you have one group with 11 and another one with 7.5. And, and the idea being that if you do this over and over again and mix the thousand people up and split them out in two different groups over and over again, you're generally going to see the same incidence in two groups in both of the groups as you did the previous experiment, assuming it's all one population. So, I mean, what, yeah, what you're gonna see is, you know, on average, we'll say the two groups will have the same incidence, right? I mean, some will, sometimes one will have more, sometimes one less, but because we've constructed our resampling process in such a way that the treatment doesn't make an effect, you know, that's the hypothesis of testing. Uh, we know that any variation is just due to randomness. So the resampling process is just a way of understanding how random fluctuations influence my experiment. You know, so, you know, I sometimes I get, you know, let's say, you know, 11 and nine, sometimes seven and 13 or whatever, you know. Yeah. Then, you know, by doing this resampling enough, I see what's sort of ordinary. What, what, I, what do I expect to get if I do this experiment lots of times? I, I did this resampling a million times and 10% um, of the time, let's say, I got a difference that was just as big as I got in my actual experiment. Okay, that means, that's a p-value of 10. And it's, that doesn't give me a whole lot of confidence that my, the difference I saw in my original experiment was due to an actual medicinal effect. Yeah. So it, it's very likely one. to be just... It'd be 0.1, right? Not 10. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, 0.1. 10%, <laughs> 0.1. Yeah. Get you, get you. Okay. Yeah. But I, I just want to say um, thank you for making you know, for walking through it again, Ryan, that, uh, you know, sometimes people are afraid to ask the question, but it, it really yeah. did cement it in. Um, and I think that was a good example, a good way to, you know, look at it. Um, it's, it, like, it's all really interesting because I think the thing that I am most kind of, um, I don't know, self-conscious about is I, I can't remember the difference between different statistical tests like i learned those i i've read them again i you know whatever they're all the same thing in my head and like having a chapter that's all about yeah like here they are <laughs> here's a reference of them now go resample <laughs> so it's kind of funny to have that <laughs> yeah i found it, find it liberating right yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's why i appreciate this book because it, it kind of gives me that the freedom to say Forget this whole zoo of tests and distributions. Uh, resampling is what you wanted to do anyway. <laughs> I have a question. Um, how does this? How does this do with um, outliers? Like, if you have a, if you're if you're looking at like uh, average income, and you have like three people that are way far and above all the others. Does this resampling procedure um, deal with that okay? Okay, now you're, you're probably asking a question that you know, an actual statistician would be better post to answer, but I'll give it my best shot here. Uh, like a resampling process, whether it's bootstrap in chapter two or permutation bootstrap in chapter three, like is only as good as your original sample. If your original samples are not really representative of the population, then there's nothing, like it doesn't, it's not magic. It, all, all the resampling is doing is telling you, is helping you quantify like typical randomness. And so if you, if you have actual outliers, 
then that might be an indication that your, your sample is not representative enough of the, of the population. Like maybe, maybe the population really extends out to the tails, but because you happen to get one of the outliers in those tails, your sample is going to be skewed in weird ways. So that, that would be my take on it. Like if you have, I mean, you always have some outliers maybe, but like if, if you have a really significant outlier that's changing your results, then it's probably an indication that your sample isn't representative enough of the population. And that's often right. why I think outliers are discarded because I say, well, if I discard the outlier, then my sample is a better representation of the population that I'm really trying to model. Yeah, that was one thing I kind of wanted to touch on too, because I think without getting into the weeds, because I think it's super easy to do that with this, like I've been thinking a lot about the data generating mechanism. Like I'm think like if you, yeah, sampled like annual income and we're trying to find the average in like Seattle, um, I think it, it would be dependent a lot on like, I don't know who would take your survey or something like that. And yeah. <laughs> you could see these issues come up. Um, yeah. Not yeah. sure if that was like on anybody else's mind as they were doing this. Like and another good point, like this resampling process is don't eliminate sampling bias because that's in your sample. So yeah, all these selection effects, whatever, you know, those are still things to be aware of and you know, avoid in other ways. Yeah, I don't, so in the book, like we won't like formally discuss sample design or kind of stuff like that, will we? I don't know. And like maybe if there'd be you interest. mentioned it in chapter two a little bit. As, you know, just you know, kind of in passing, I think. Yeah. Doesn't look like it. Yeah, I think that was, was all there. Well, I have, I just wanted one thing, you know, related to some vocabulary in the chapter is uh, the the trick for re remembering type one error versus type two error when people talk in, in those terms is uh, the boy who cried wolf, the villagers make a type one error and then a type two error in order. Because <laughs> they have a false positive wolf and then they have a false negative wolf. <laughs> I like that a lot. <laughs> That's just helpful. <laughs> are there any other type errors? Are there like a type three or four? I don't know. There Not are categorization. I was gonna say I think there are joke type errors <laughs> that people, you know, like type three is uh, when you think that it's not positive, but then it, um, you know, then you realize it really was positive, but then it, it actually turns out it wasn't positive or you know things like that. <laughs> and then, like false error. correction of false positive is a type three error or something like that. Like justified true belief that's not knowledge is like a type yeah. three. <laughs> or, or asking the wrong question in the first place. Yep. <laughs> zero error. <laughs> <laughs> so the only other thing in the chapter we didn't talk about is power, as in statistical power. And really roughly my understanding of that is sort of knowing how many people or how many, how big the N has to be to answer the question you want to answer. Right, right. And for that, to really know that, you have to have some idea of what the answer is going to be. There was a, many, okay, not too many months ago, there was a study that came out of somewhere in Europe. They were testing masks see whether they're effective in preventing the spread of COVID. I don't also want to get into this, right? But um, like they, so they designed their experiment to, to test uh, like whether wearing masks significantly decreases your chances of getting infected. So their treatment then was wearing masks, not wearing masks. And so they had a, a number of people they followed for this study. That's their, their sample size. And they calculated how many people they would need based on some uh, assumed overall incidence of getting sick, right? Because that matters. Like if, if, if it's a disease that let's say only, you know, one, one in a million people are getting anyway, then you need a really large sample. Otherwise, chances are no one's gonna get sick either way. <laughs> so so, so you, to, 
to know how big your sample needs to be, you have to have some idea of the rate of incidence. Okay, now what turned out is the results, which were you know, misinterpreted by certain people, were that they, they didn't find a statistically significant difference, at, at least for a certain measure, that wearing masks made. Right? So, so in their experiment, wearing masks didn't make a statistically significant difference now that's easy to, to misinterpret there, right? Because if I just take out statistically, then what I have is a statement, mass didn't make a significant difference. And that gets interpreted as mass didn't make a difference at all. But what the outcome was, was that, you know, they had this confidence interval that just was huge. Like, you know, the 95% confidence interval overlapped a, you know, zero percent difference that masks make, as well as like a factor of two difference that they were, they were targeting, they were designing their experiment to measure. And, and you know, you can, it's easy to see what happened is the overall disease rate that they actually got in their experiment was just lower than they had been guessing. And so just not enough people got sick across the two groups for them. So when they did their resampling or whatever actually they used, you know, it was just a small enough number of people that the, there was a, you know, a, a wide distribution in the difference in the results, just because, you know, it's it, working with small numbers here. And so, so basically, you know, what the, the result of that paper was, you know, they underestimated the power that they needed. And so the, the results didn't say anything. Like, it was just, oh, we didn't sample enough people. Unfortunately, that's never the message that comes across in these things. And if I say I didn't measure a statistically significant result, you know, lay people often take that as there is no effect. When the truth is, I just didn't do enough science to confidently say that I found an effect. And those are really different statements. So, you know, so knowing about statistical power ahead of time before you do experiment is helpful. And even if you do, knowing about it afterwards is really good in communicating. So I'm just to rephrase statistical power, I think of it like um, your ability to detect the null. If the null is true, or your prob the probability that you'll detect the null if the null is true. Or, or maybe the other way, I would think of it as the chance that you would falsify the null if the null is not true. But I could be completely mm -hmm. wrong on this, because like I said, I am not an expert. <laughs> These double negatives are confusing me. Falsify the null <laughs> if the null is not true. Right, right. It's really like just your ability to detect like a, a treatment effect versus random variation, right? right. Yeah. Yeah, because like, you know, so if the, if the null is say that my treatment doesn't work and I, and my sample is just like two people in each in group A and group B, that's really low power. And I haven't, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to falsify the null. Like I, I, no way can I confidently say, even if like both people in one group get, just get sick and both in the other group don't, like, even if like I have that really skewed result, I haven't falsified the null hypothesis because I do my resampling, it's just going to be all over the place. And I'll get that result just by random chance, like, you know, a large fraction of the time. Makes sense, yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know what I, I think I've said, like everything I've thought about on this. So like, I have nothing significant to, to contribute. I don't so, think. so as far as, so it's how does, so power still ties into our resampling method in the same way that power would tie into the other statistical. I, I think so. Like, I mean, power is sort of independent of uh, the method you're using, sorta. I might be, might be misspeaking a little bit here. But it's just, it's about how big your sample 
is, how big it has to be to measure what you want. And whether you, you measure your significance by doing the right thing and resampling or by doing the lazy thing and doing a, a, a significance test, you know, then like it, it shouldn't matter. And the book gives, gives a few examples of, okay, if we do resampling, oh, like we get the same result-ish if we use a traditional test. It shouldn't matter. I mean, that's, I, you, you, I, I really, I think, tipped my, my hand here. I'm like, you can, like, it's all about resampling. Forget this traditional tests. Only use those if, you know, for educational purposes. I don't know. Even then, don't. <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> If you don't, if you don't have access to the underlying data and you can't resample, then I guess you know maybe you can use this, a, this traditional test. But if you have the data, if you have you know the the case by case results, then do the resampling. And that's true for every statistical test, right? So like we're you know, so. t-test, ANOVA, all of them. I mean, oh yeah, I was doing it. thanks for mentioning ANOVA <clears throat> because that, that took me a little bit in the book to uh, um, get my mind around. So in our, let me see if I can find it. They have this, do you know what page this is on? So I can go through it quickly. Um, 118 for ANOVA. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, I think it's the LM our, arm package, if that's what you're trying to find. Uh, let me see. I, there's something I'm looking for just to. 121. Yep, I'm I'm there. I'm trying to find a okay. line now. Okay. Um, there is. Okay, I think this is. They have this function in the LPERM package that's AOVP, and there's um, also an AOV. So AOVP, I think the P is for permutation. And so what that does is it calculates an ANOVA-like thing. So, and you know, if I were better prepared, I could explain to you better what ANOVA is. I'm telling you everything I remember. It calculates an ANOVA-like thing by doing basically a, a permutation resample. But there's also these heuristic approximations to it, which are what just traditionally is known as ANOVA. And that's the AOV function. So an ANOVA thing, which is, I guess that's essentially like analysis of variance. And it's, it's you know, I, I remember reading through it and thinking, oh, this is a lot simpler and kind of more naive than I thought it was. <laughs> and unfortunately, I'm not prepared enough to explain why I had that thought, but I remember having that thought. So you guys can, can read it and tell me if my thought is right. That uh, but so, so the ANOVA thing, yeah, is something that you can do, you can get for, by resampling. And that's probably the best way to do it, if you can. Yeah, I think this is probably the best way to learn ANOVA because when I learned it in grad school, it was like garbage compared to this. Um, <laughs> because, yeah, I mean, the whole point is that like with ANOVA, you're, you're testing to see if the variance between groups is greater than the variance within groups. And I think like, yeah, just permuting individuals into these two different populations um, is like the perfect way to do it. And then, you know, developing your sampling distribution um, of like the F statistic, I guess it is. Right, because if there was no difference between groups, then you would expect to see the same variation throughout every group, right? And then... I, think so. I mean, randomly, right? Like, you know, there'll be, there'll be differences <laughs> because of the random sampling. And that's what you're sampling tests. But on average, yes. And how would you um, bring in adjustment then for multiple testing with that method? I don't know. Multiple testing meaning? So, you know, the way you would have to use Bonferroni or like Benjamini Hotchberger that there, like if you were doing the likes of 
you know, the way when it comes to like genomics or that there, you're looking at so much that the likelihood is that you will find significance where there is none just because of the sheer oh. number of tests you're yes. doing. But then how would, what would you do then? <laughs> I mean, ask me what I would do is, is not like I, whatever I say, it doesn't matter because like, you know, you've, you've seen everything I know about this already. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like that Don't reminds think... me of the XKCD thing about jelly beans, right? Like if you, mm-hmm. if you run enough tests, like I, <sighs> from what I recall from the book discussion, and I could be misrepresenting this, the the best approach to that is to, and this, this feels dirty, but I mean, like, like just <laughs> decide ahead of time what you're going to look at. And then like in that space of things you're going to look at, like you can kind of I have to lift my hands here, but like quantify what um, it matters. Okay. And I'm not saying this very well. But like, if think about the jelly beans, because that's where my simple mind goes, right? Um, like, I I can imagine, you know, sorry, I, I'm saying I'm going to look at all the different colors of the jelly beans to see whether there's a significant effect with each one. I mean, I, I think you you probably can imagine at least doing some sort of like meta resampling process to see how often I get, you know. So basically, what you're trying to get at is what's significant I and mean, so my simple mind is going back to the question if i were to do this experiment again how likely is it that i'd get the same result the same within meaningful parameters right so i can i can imagine doing resampling no matter how many things i'm looking at and you know, if i do my resampling in the jelly beans and this time green shows up significant this time red shows up significant like then I can I kind of know that those are spurious significances. <laughs> so I I I could be overselling this, but I think that robust resampling can help quantify and expose a lot of these problems. Because the whole idea between behind resampling, I'm going to simulate doing my experiment again. And doing my experiment again is really the question I want to answer. If I did this again, how likely would it be to get the same result? Because that's, that's what medical testing is. If I do this experiment again on the whole population now, what's the chance that I get the same result? <laughs> right. you know, what's, how well does my result extrapolate? So, I mean, I don't know if I answered the question, but I, raising my hands, I think that resampling is a valuable tool in, in that as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, um, my work is in genomics, so I'm, I'm like pretty used to using like FDR and, and stuff. But so I think for this, like for a single experiment, like if you're repeating, you're, you're resampling a thousand times, I mean, that's your, your p-value is like the probability that you would see an extreme or as extreme result if you resampled. So you can't really compute a p-value off of one test. So you kind of need that as like a single experiment. But if you had like five groups and you were comparing one to two, one to three, one to four, one to five, then you would definitely need to do a multiple testing correction. And then if you can imagine like doing that in genomics for like a thousand or 10,000, you're definitely going to have some that pop up just by chance. I I think this Um, is to, to add on to that, I think the ANOVA test is all it can tell you is that there's a difference between one group and another, not yeah. that there's multiple or something along those lines. Yeah. And I think, I think they touch on that, like sort of a grouped ANOVA. Yeah. And it'll just tell you like one is different, but it won't tell you which one. But then I guess if you did like, um, yeah, if you compared each group, to each other group, then you would use a multiple testing correction. And they have some right. heuristic you can calculate like the probability that at least one of your tests is gonna be um, false positive just by chance. But, I, and I think with like the multiple testing, I mean, that's a whole nother rabbit hole um, that I went down a lot and I wish I did it for my masters, but um, <laughs> yeah, I, I like FDR cause it's just like you maximize, it's like a balance between being um, 
not stringent enough and like maximizing statistical power, whereas Bonferroni is more like, um, you know, you cannot, absolutely cannot include a false positive. So for like, you know, medical stuff or, um, cause Bonferroni is like super conservative. And I think it, it like, you know, you, you create a new alpha based on the number of tests you have. So your P value has to be like infinitesimally small for you to actually detect a significant result. Um, You guys, this has been really awesome. Yeah. And we actually have to like leave a little bit early, I think, John. Yeah. I was we, we, say, we got to that. <laughs> got to get going. But that did, yeah, that went um, much better than I expected for a uh, kind of off the cuff meeting. So, yay. Um, I, so I think, you know, resolving the question that I had in the chat this morning, I, I think let's go ahead and continue to chapter four next week. I feel like we did did this chapter justice. Um, and so Morgan, uh, hopefully you're ready or you will be ready rather. Um, we will still uh, do some prep. Uh, Jonathan and I as like, you know, again, we're doing this kind of for work. So uh, hopefully if something happens, we can still have a conversation. Um, yeah. And thank you all for, thank you. for showing up. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Jonathan, for being ready to go off the cuff. Yeah, that was awesome. That, that went better than I did, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.